right, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here after four years. I was here for three months, four years ago, so it's nice to be back. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, as the title says, relative field theories. And I thought I would, in the beginning, try to put you a little bit into, <coughs> give you a bit of context also regarding the talks that are to come this upcoming week, because there will be several ideas that actually play a role in this uh, talk that are closely related to other talks that we'll see this week. So I'll roughly have two sides of the story. Maybe this board is a bit too big, but it's okay. So as a, I'm a mathematician. Um, so as a mathematician wanting to study field theories, um, I like to have some sort of an axiomatic framework to be able to deal with, uh, to hopefully kind of put this into a, 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 a framework, a context. And there are two different ones that will appear and that we will also see appearing this week, I guess. So on the one side, and this is the older one, is the functorial approach. So maybe let me call this approach to field theories, sometimes just called functorial field theories. Um, so this is something you've probably all seen at some point. So this goes back to Atiyah and Siegel and their axiomatizations of topological quantum field theories and conformal field theories. And roughly you should think of this more or less as describing some sort of a state space. And then on the other side, we have what I will write under the kind of combined uh, word of factorization algebra. So this is the ideas that go into this and the examples that I will write down in a second, of course, have been around for decades. But they have somehow really been a very successful tool in all kinds of math and math approaches to mathematical phys uh, to quantum field theories in the recent years and somehow have been widely studied. So here you should think of them as being the observables of a QFT or maybe I should say to be precise a perturbative QFT. And really using the framework of factorization algebras, which I won't define here, um, really showing that this is really true is due to Owen William, and who's here this week, and Kevin Costello. So maybe to connect to some talks that we will see, there will be a lot of talks that fit into this side here. So for example, we will see vertex algebras appearing. You should also think them of them as somehow being on this observable side. We will see chiral algebras appearing. And so both of them I would like to write down. We'll see the talks of Emily Cliff, Owen William, and Brian Williams. We will see n algebras appearing on Friday in a talk by Damien Kalak. We already saw factorization homology this morning in David's talk. And I assume it will appear again in Tim Willing's talk on Wednesday and also in David Jordan's talk on Friday. Um, and also maybe EN algebras, which we've already seen just before. I mean, this goes into the factorization homology, but just to write that down again. And for us, factorization algebras for today, for this talk, are more like a tool, um, and it won't really appear prominently. It's just the main tool that's running in the background that I won't really talk about that much. So what about the other side? The other side, so this was the original kind of 
approach defined by these two people. And of course, there have been many developments about this. So let me just tell you abstractly what a functorial field theory is um, and what kind of extensions we will consider. So I would just like to give you the slogan that a functorial field theory is a functor from something I will call board N to something for now I will call vect. And I don't want to give you the precise definitions today. I'm happy to talk about that in more detail. I just like to avoid the technicalities. But on this side, we will have something like a category of n-dimensional cobordisms. So the picture for this, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll draw it above because I'm in the space. Something like this. You should think of it this as a space-time coming from this space to that space. That's what a cobordism is. And this cobordisms we can put vary quite a bit. So first of all, we can put some structures on it. with some geometric structures. So for example, conformal structure, holomorphic structure, um, but also topological structures, as we saw this morning. So I want to keep this a little bit ambiguous here. In the examples that we will really look at, we will be looking at the topological situation like this morning. But more generally, the story you can also write down in this non-topological situation. And another modification is that maybe here I don't want to just have a category, but some sort of a higher category. Maybe the index will be a K, it might be a K category, infinity K category, something. But if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it too much for today's purposes. What about the other side? On the other side, we have some sort of a category of linear things. So, well, if it's just a category, then this will be like vector spaces. Maybe more generally, you would actually like to have something like a Hilbert space, but to make our lives easier for today, we'll just take vector spaces. But you you're free to change this and to add in extra things as you please, as you, as you need. So here we will put some sort of a possibly K category of, and usually they will be some C linear objects. We'll see some examples later on. So just keep in mind vector spaces, c-linear vector spaces, that's fine, or some generalizations thereof, some suitable ones. And again, I'm happy to talk about this in more detail if you wish. Okay, so, right. So we will also see things like that in a later talk this week, namely um, by Kurzat Sosa. Did I say that right? Yes, okay. Um, in a variant of a homotopical quantum field theory. So there also, you have to vary this definition a little bit. Um, but somehow what I want to talk today is this relative field theory situation. So um, again, we have to, sometimes the objects that we're interested in, the quantum field theories we're interested in, just don't fit into this rather rigid framework. And we want to relax this notion a little bit and modify it to make certain examples fit in. So Maybe a problem you might have heard of is that sometimes you just deal with an anomalous field theory. So uh, that can be in this framework. One way of describing this is to say, well, it doesn't really fit this strict functorial framework, but we have to modify it some way. And um, how to deal with this is somehow the purpose of these relative field theories. So. And then let's try to see what we can do. So 
So now instead of having just a functor as above, and again, I'm a little bit agnostic what my bordisms precisely are. Choose your favorite bordism category. And we will have some target here. And for the purposes of including this k over there, I will add a little k here to indicate this k. But if you don't like higher categories, just forget about that. So here, now the problem is I want a k plus 1 here. But again, it's not so necessary right now. And now instead of looking at a functor, I want to look at a relative situation. So I want to put something here that I will call t. And I want some sort of a map from c to t. So this here you should think of as the anomaly. At least in case this theory is invertible, which means it assigns invertible vector spaces, so one-dimensional vector spaces to everything. is the trivial field theory that really assigns C to every object and the identity on C to every morphism. So you might ask, what's the difference between invertible and C? Well, an invertible is isomorphic to this one, but maybe the choice of isomorphism between the one-dimensional vector space and C is not canonical. So that's a, a subtlety there. but. Um, Right? Uh, I mean, if you have a one-dimensional vector space, you can choose an isomorphism to see. And that isomorphism, we want to, on purpose, keep here. That's exactly where the anomaly comes from. Um, or we will usually call it the twist. OK, so such a situation I will call a relative field theory, so C z is relative to t. OK. So sometimes this might be invertible, but sometimes not. There are also situations where it's not, for example, if you have the space of conformal blocks or so. But I have not told you how to interpret this picture. I have not given you a definition of what this means. OK. So let's see. Um, want this to disappear. Yeah. So this, of course, is also not at all a new thing, writing it in this way. Um, and somehow these anomaly theories have been dealt with in many different ways. And one thing that ties into this picture, this is one of the interpretations, is that of a defect field theory. And I mean in a probably very different incarnation, but somehow related, um, we will see defect field theories appearing in Nekrasov's talk on Friday. And maybe the defect field theory is a better situation when I say, OK, here, I call this top field theory, I call this S. And in my relative situation, this happens to be C. But more generally, I could choose also just any functor here and have some sort of a relative thing here. And now if S is really C, as in the situation I started out with, this is usually called something like a boundary field theory. So, OK, why can I think of such a defect field theory as implementing something like this? So let me choose two colors. Let me call T will now be blue and S will be yellow. Is this visible? Also in the back. Um, so now you should you can think of 
a defect field theory. What's a defect field theory? Now you take a cobordism, which has a codimension one defect, so a codimension one submanifold. Let me draw you a picture to make that more clear. This should be white. And I color my cobordism in two colors. Maybe something like this. And so now you can think of somehow S, if now all my cobordisms look something like that, they might in particular also just be yellow, or they might just be blue. They might just have no co-dimension one effect, defect. So in the just yellow case, this will be the field theory S. And in the just blue case, this will be the theory T. And somehow you should think of the Z as somehow sitting on this co-dimension one thing. Okay. So this is for n equals one. This is the picture that you, sh you can think of. So now we kind of define, so now if we give a definition of, well, we, we have a board with defects now to my k plus one vect, something like this, um, then you can think of this as implementing this situation, as being somehow a morphism from S to T. Or maybe, well, if we're a little agnostic here, it's not so clear which direction it goes. So maybe from C to S. So this is, this is a way one can, one can think about these things. This is not the approach that we will take today. Another approach that one can do is, well, I defined a functorial field theory as just being a functor. And in mathematics, we have a nice notion of morphism between functors, namely a natural transformation. So another way we can discuss this is as trans natural transformations. And for technical reasons, I don't want to go into details about, um, I have to add these words lax or oplax, because we're really in the higher category world. So maybe I should say, there is a paper called Relative Field Theories, uh, theories on the Archive by Fried and Telemann, and their examples usually they are examples in this situation. Um, and this approach has been kind of promoted by. Stefan Stolz and Peter Teichner. Um, and in this higher category setting, we need to make sense of this definition even. And um, to make sense of this definition, that was something I did together with Thea Johnson Fried. Okay, so we'll come back a little bit, very briefly, to this side over there. Um, but for the most part of the talk, I will just stay on this side. Just because here um, we have some tools that make it easier to deal with this side. But they're not completely unrelated, and we'll see that. Okay. So what's, there is some sort of a philosophy behind uh, this, which I would like to briefly mention, and which will be somehow the motivation, the motivation for the examples that I will give at the end. And the motivation is that, well, we can't always get our field theories into this rigid framework here. 
And there's also choices to be made, even if we go to this relative situation, right? What's S, what's T, that kind of story. And so one philosophy behind this is that the field theory, maybe it doesn't exist somehow in this absolute sense, but it should exist relative to something coming from its observables. This is a philosophy, this is not a precise statement, but it will be the philosophy or the guiding motivation for the examples that we will look at, the simple ones. So I want to have some sort of a picture that takes my bordisms. I have my C, my trivial field theory at the top. I put my observables as this relative thing. And then my field theory will be something like this. Again, I want to be a little bit agnostic about the direction of this morphism. And the direction will have some different meanings. If you go the other way, you could think of this as being some sort of a expectation value. To an observable, you assign a number. That's something like an expectation value, maybe. The other way, you pick out an observable. So maybe it's more something like a vacuum vector, something like this. Can you help me understand how things match up? So on a closed n manifold, observables mm -hmm. it will be like a, a vector space, not a number. And that's, that's keeping the prep, that's yeah. so by k plus 1 back then board n, how are the numbers matched up? Ah, okay. So um, if this is a k category, this will be a k plus 1 category. Um, so you will only see the k part here uh -huh. uh, for the observables. On closed n manifolds. So on closed n manifolds, you will get a k and, and a top thing, so a vector space, yes. Okay. Exactly. Um, the plus one here is only comes into the play in Z. So Z, because it's exactly lax or op lax and not just a natural transformation, it really uses that you have extra morphisms here. So the factum here is not the C, but from the observables you choose, but what is C here? Is, is it vacuum or? Well, this is, this is again, this is the trivial field theory. I mean, I, I have not really told you what this is. But yeah, if it's, um, it's, it's the field theory that assigns C to everything, the, the trivial object in here. Is that the vacuum? No? I don't know. Okay. Well, but you pick out one. Maybe, maybe let me do an, an example. Um, so the, the, the vacuum, I mean, this really just picks out C, the vector space C. You can call that the vacuum, but you won't see any relation to anything else. The relation to anything else, how the vacuum looks as a vector in somehow the state space, that really uses this morphism here. You can say, okay, this is just the vacuum. You can say that if you wish, but it doesn't have a meaning without, like, it just really assigns the trivial vector space C to everything. You don't see it. Z is the creation operator here from the vacuum, maybe? I did not see what uh, here. Z is the creation operator? Creation of it. Okay, so, so I told you before that the factorization algebra side somehow describes these observables. So if I want to kind of realize this uh, motivation, this philosophy, starting from a factorization algebra, I should be able to get something like what I have here. So, um, this is one thing that Dwyer, Stoltz, and Teichner did is that starting with a factorization algebra, and now G here is a, ge a geometry, just want to keep to their notation. Then we get now this is the bordism category for this geometry. I should 
here with something like topological algebras. Here you have your trivial guy, and here you have this f, a twist coming from this f. Okay. They do also get something here, but this is not really a state space. This is more something like, um, we, we will see this in examples later in a very simple one. But uh, you do get this twist. So really, indeed, from the observables, you get this uh, such a candidate for a twist here. And so this, this here is in the one categorical situation and the extended situation. And in the topological situation, Here, now I have one of these n categories. It's actually an infinity n category. I have a topological situation. I take framings. But yes, indeed, I get this twist functor. And here, we have to put something that I don't want to explain in detail. The objects are in algebras. And again, somehow, yeah, let's, let's keep it at that. And the main tool here. is exactly the factorization homology that we saw before. All right. So I said before we want to focus on the topological situation today. And the reason is that there are strong tools that we can use in that situation. Um, so we have something called the cobordism hypothesis, which we heard about in the last talk. And this helps. It gives us a simple way to go about constructing these things. So why, why does this help us? Well, if we're in this situation that I wrote down at the bottom of the board over there, and look now at a TFT, a topological field theory, which goes from this category that I had over there, fully extended, whatever that means. I have um, a functor to some nice target category. In our cases of interest, it will be those linear things over there. And such a TFT, fully extended TFT, is fully determined by its value at a point. So this value at a point, so I'm in the case here, where my bordisms, I go all the way down. I have n dimensional guys and n minus 1 dimensional guys and n minus 2 dimensional guys, and I go all the way down to point. So my point will be something in here. Okay. And so if I have the value of the point, um, this fully, I can recover my z just from knowing what it is at a point. So this somehow tells you that you have a locality in some sense. My no matter where I am, it's determined by what happens locally. And what is this value of the point, moreover? This is any so-called n-dualizable object in C. And this n-dualizable, I did not tell you what this is, but this is and this is somehow important, it's an algebraic condition and can be checked by hand and may or may not be easier than just writing down z itself. Um, but in certain situations, it definitely is. So to give you an example, 
if we take C to be just vector spaces, then being one dualizable, it's just a fancy word for saying I have V is finite dimensional. Okay. So there are dimensionality res restrictions, essentially. These algebraic conditions translate to having some sort of a d finite dimensionality conditions. So what is another example? And now I can start giving you some, some examples of possible things that we can put here. So one thing would be I can take something I will call alg. So maybe I should tell you this here is an example for k equals 1. This is an example for k equals 2. This is a two category. So we have objects or algebras. Morphisms from an algebra to another algebra are A, B, I modules. <coughs> Composition is tensor product, relative tensor product. And then we have two morphisms, our homomorphisms. So note if I just take A and B to be K, the ground field here, C, if you wish, then a CC bimodule is just a vector space. It's just an object up here. And a homomorphism of those guys will just be a linear map. So that's the sense in which I mean this is a generalization of vect, and I have C linear object somehow. OK, what does two dualizable mean here? So A is two dualizable if and only if A is one finite dimensional and two, it's semi simple. Over C. Okay, so again, these are really strong finiteness conditions. And there's some other examples um, that I could give you, but um, yeah. There is a common generalization of this result. Uh, what did I call it over there? Alg n. This Alg n over there that I did not really tell you about. So objects are en algebras. But here, n dualizable A is always n dualizable. So here, this is an en algebra, and it's always n dualizable. And that's the translation of this bottom arrow over there. This is something that Owen and I recently proved. OK, why did I take this detour? I took this detour because I showed you now that the cobordism hypothesis allows us to build um, TFTs quite efficiently. Namely, we only have to look at our target category and do some algebraic manipulations. We can translate our problem from a problem of understanding, well, writing down something to do with geometry into just checking certain algebraic conditions. And this definition on the right here allows us to do the same thing in this relative situation. Um, on the left, there is also a sort of cobordism hypothesis statement, which at the moment is more conjecturally. So there is something one can do here, um, but it's not, it's not proven in all details. So let's go back to the relative situation. And um, so I have my S at the top, 
and some T at the bottom. I have some Z here. And now I have any target. It might be one of these, might be something else. So now the analogous situation to the statement over there, we're in this uh, topological situation now. And the analogous statement to the statement up there is that uh, this is fully determined by the value at a point again. which is in this left-hand situation, we have, this is more like a conjecture, <coughs> that z of the point now is what I will call, for the purposes of today, strongly relative dualizable. And on this side, and this here is a theorem proven by Theo Johnson Fried and myself from above. And this is based upon the usual cobordism hypothesis. And this says that it's determined by z of point, which is, and now here I will just call this relatively and dualizable. And one can prove, actually, that this implies that. So this strongly relative and dualizable implies, sorry, I should be more precise. This condition implies that condition. And this, I would just like to mention a name. This was pointed out to me by Manuel Araujo. So if we want to have a chance at building relative field theories, if I start on this side, there's not much harm because this is somehow the minimal thing I can do in this topological situation and then I can try to see if I can enhance it to one of these stronger ones that maybe, maybe you would be more interested in. Okay, so I will unravel what this condition here means now in the low examples that I would like to show you. In some sense, we translated our problem of finding these topological examples to algebraic manipulations. And what I thought was kind of neat was the types of algebraic objects that started appearing. Of course, this is a toy model or to kind of trying to test the definition if you want to actually go to more physically interesting examples and more geometric situations. So, and these examples, I would like to say, is something that Owen William and I worked out. All right, let's start with n equals 1. So, in n equals 1, I want to get a situation like this. Put my S at the top, my T at the bottom. And then I will choose, just because I already introduced it, this alge here. So this should now be a two category here. This is the K plus one that I had above. So this, this is a one category, this is a two category. And I'll take this over there. So what will my Z of the point be? This is a morphism in ALG, so a bimodule, which 
actually this is true for both examples. So in situation A, I will choose a particularly simple one. I will just take an algebra and view it as a module from C to itself. Okay. So this is kind of a stupid by module, but it works. And so this is, and something I've been suppressing so far is that in the very beginning here, up there, I said I need something called lax or oplax. And this is the only situation, n equals 1 is the only situation where this matters. So I didn't want to dwell on it, but now I have to add it in again. So it's either lax or oplax relatively one dualizable. If and only if A is one finitely presented and projective, and two, uh, yeah, sorry, that's all finite presented and projective over. And now I have the distinction. In the lax case, I need C. And in the oplax case, I need A. So so lax corresponds to this situation. So what does that mean? Well, this here is actually just says that it's finite dimensional, right? So I'm kind of back at the finite dimensionality properties. But this one, this is always satisfied. A is always finite present and projective over itself. So that means in this relative situation, if I choose this, this case here, um, I always get something, not just in a finite dimensional situation. This might look a little bit arbitrary, um, but turns out to be rather useful. Okay, so one, one idea that you might have, and actually this is true more generally, if I put any module here, it will be laxly relative one dualizable if this M is finite present and projective over this left side, and it will be oplaxly relatively dualizable if it has the same property over the right side. So you get this relative finiteness here. Okay, so now an idea is that if A is an algebra, I know I start with A, that's an algebra of observables, then choosing a laxly one dualizable M from A to C gives on S1 Well, I first have to evaluate at S1. That will be just the Hochschild homology. Then my M gives me a functor, a morphism, sorry, an algebra homomorphism, a morph homomorphism to the value over S1 at C which is just C. And now here I can also get the canonical map from A going to its Hochschild homology. And this is something you can think of as the trace. So to every A, I assign a value in C. So if you think of A as being the observables, well, I kind of gave you a way of extracting a number. And you can think of this as somehow expectation value. So just from starting from one of these, you get something like an expectation value. We just started with observables. Okay, and now my, my other example. <coughs> a 
And this other example will be motivated by this philosophy on the right. So now I start with a vector space, which I would like to think of as the states and look at the following bimodule. I look at V as a module for its endomorphisms. And here I put C again. And so now I can check my conditions, my algebraic conditions. So this is relatively one dualizable. If and only if, well again I have two conditions. The first one, the lax one, this is always. So what do I have to check? I have to check that V is finitely presented and projective over its endomorphisms. That's always true. And in the second case, in the oplex case, I have, again, my finite dimensionality. So. In the TFT world, we had the one dualizability, had this finite dimensionality. And now in the relative situation, relatively one dualizable, we have finite dimensionality in one situation. But if you look at it the other way around, actually, we always get something. Okay. And this is, this is a, somehow for me, showcases this idea of, well, it should always be a field theory relative to its observables. Again, this is a very baby toy example, of course. So let's see how to generalize this, how to categorify this. So now we want to look at n equals 2. So what will I put here? I will put here this mysterious alg n that I did not define. So now for n equals 2. And we'll just stick to the vector spaces. So what's this? So objects are commutative algebras. Morphisms, one morphisms our bimodules again, which are in addition algebras. And now forgetting that it's a bimodule, I'm back to algebras. So now I can kind of stick in the thing that I had above. So now two morphisms are bimodules of algebras which is compatible with the lower structure. And then three morphisms is just homomorphisms. So somehow I kind of souped up this example over there. So usually I will call these R and S. These are R, S bimodules. If I have two elements A and B here, then these will be A, B bimodules. So how can we go about generalizing the examples above? 
Well, the first example, we just looked at an object as a module over itself. We can do the same thing again. Pick R commutative algebra. Um, and I can look at R as a module for itself. Um, more generally, maybe, I can take pick A any R algebra, and then I can look A as a module for R coming from the right. And then this determines a 2D relative TFT by these 2D two dual relative dualizability conditions if and only if We'll write down the general statement. A is finitely presented and projective over R. And two, A is separable over R. And so this is the bottom situation. So if you look at what happens up here, if now A equals R, this first situation will just be true. Um, and the second case is also true. So again, this first guy gives you an example of a relative two-dimensional two situation. More generally, we get these, still have this final present and projective condition that we had before, which is finite dimensionality, and a new thing appears, the separability. And now for the last, last one, <coughs> for B, this will be the generalization of this endomorphisms example that we had above. This board, no, where? Did I just erase that? I guess I just erased that. Um, so before we were looking at V as a morphism from its endomorphisms to C. So how do I categorify that? Well, I replace V by an algebra A, and I replace my endomorphisms by the center of A. So these are all the elements in A which commute with everything else. Why this is an appropriate generalization, I would like to not go into it here. If you think of a derived situation, if you look at derived endomorphisms, then this will be the exactly the derived center, the Hochschild cohomology. So that's the analogous thing that you should keep in mind. And now our theorem tells us that we can look at A. Now for certain reasons I would prefer to put Z of A on the right. It doesn't really matter that much. This determines 2D relative TFT if and only if 1 A is finitely presented and projective over Z of A and 2 A is separable over C of A. And this has another name, namely this is called an Azumaya algebra. So this is something that algebraists are excited by. And classifying these things is something you can use Brouwer theory and stuff like that to do. OK, so maybe um, one example of such an Azamaya algebra is if you can, you can take the differential operators on the affine line, however, in characteristic P. So that might or might not be, make you happy. Um, but it's somehow a showcase that if we take an algebra, maybe we can go back to what we had before. If we started with an algebra here for two dualizability, we needed these rather strong conditions, finite dimensional over C and semi-simple over C. Now, if we're in this relative situation here, 
if this were over C, then we're exactly in that case. But now we're relaxed our conditions to being over C to being just over Z of A, just over its center. So this is somehow a relaxation of these conditions over there. Okay, I th we'll stop here. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, given such an Azumaya algebra, what kind of invariance does that T of T? Uh, That's a really good question. Tell me. <laughs> it looks like just family of metric algebra with family of invariance. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's kind of a parametrized version. Right. Yeah, so an example that comes to mind, which is not maybe quite Azumaya, but if you take a quantum group at the root of unity, then somehow it's like, the categorification. Yeah, so that's actually a hope that for the three-dimensional situation that will be exactly what comes out. Yeah, great question. Any other questions? Is there a structured version of this? Instead of frame polarism category, if it takes some polarism category with some structure? Uh, yeah, you can, you can apply. Um, so this theorem that uh, uh, gave you the relative end dualizability that uses the usual cobordism hypothesis. So you can use the version with structure of the cobordism hypothesis. However, unraveling what that means in terms of these conditions is not so straightforward. That will have to depend on the example that you're in. Understanding that G action is kind of hard. Mm -hmm.